Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today is a special guest. We have Joel Van Horn, who is the CTO of Pet Plate. Joel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, let's let's start at the beginning here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you uh, some of your background, and how you came to be at Pet Plate? Sure, sure. I'll start with what Pet Plate is. So, I'm the CTO of Pet Plate. It's a human grade dog food company. What we do is we ship personalized uh, meal plans directly to your door. What we do is we ask a few questions about your dog. Uh, we use a proprietary algorithm to figure out the right meal plan and serving size for them. And then we ship pre-portioned containers uh, that are resealable right to your door. Um, last year, we raised our Series A. And among our investors are General Mills 301 Inc., as well as DFE Enterprises, which is the uh, Doran's family. Uh, so more about myself specifically, my background is pretty diverse. I've been an entrepreneur most of my career. Okay. I actually started in graphic design, which led to programming, which then led to product management. Um, then I had a switch into a different career, which was information security, where I became a white hat hacker. That was probably the most illuminating <laughs> experience of my life. Sure. Learning, learning about all the vulnerabilities, not just in tech, but the physical world. So that sure. was you know, scary and interesting and so on and so forth. Um, but after, you know, after that stint for the last 10 years, I've been back into the entrepreneurial world working with startups. You know, what I found through that experience with information security was I didn't enjoy breaking things. So I wanted to start building things again. Um, and that's where I started getting into e-commerce consulting. And through that, you know, direct to consumer really started becoming very popular in the last 10 years. Um, I started working with CPG brands like Freshly and Daily Harvest, helped them launch. Um, at the time, we were using off-the-shelf software, which was extremely painful to deal with. <laughs> um, and by the time I started working with Pet Plate in a consulting capacity about four years ago, uh, the realization was we really have to build something custom. And yeah. that's you know where the story kind of starts with Pet Plate. Um, and then I joined the team full-time last year as a CTO, and yeah. now with, with the Series A, and now we're starting to build our team up from there. Fantastic. That That's awesome. So I will say that I uh, had your colleague Gertrude Allen on, uh, the CEO, a few weeks ago on the show, uh, about to publish here shortly, but um, gave, gave me a lot of great background on the com company and actually sent me an intro box of Pet Plate for uh, for my dog, Kona. And I will tell you, she will not eat anything but that now. She <laughs> she is a fan and uh, we, we are going to become subscribers here once we get through that box. But it is a pretty fantastic product. I will say that. I have to ask you a weird question. Did you try it yourself? Did I try it myself? I, I did not. I've I've heard it's human grade food, but no, I, I actually I haven't done it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect you to, but I fully admit I've tried it. Many of us have had it, and it's actually yeah. not that bad. Really, if you run out of food, you can eat it. <laughs> it you've got something there. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got the uh, you know assortment of flavors, and she likes them all. So uh, we actually even seen a, a difference in her coat. You know, looks shinier, and uh, you know, I I think she's a happier dog. That's awesome. Great to hear that testimonial. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you, you, you hit on it there in your background, Joel, you know, having been an entrepreneur um, and then on the technology side, doing everything from security to design to development, uh, coding. So bringing yourself back to your current role at Plet Pet Plate, I'm sure you draw on a lot of those experiences, right, for, for what your role is now, you know, bringing all of those things together. But what, what do you say, what do you look back at as some of the more valuable experiences you had that kind of lend, lend themselves into the role that you have today? Yeah, so, um, you know, overall, I think with technology coming from a, you know, product management background, which led into information security, I really kind of started understanding how people use software. Okay. Um, thinking about it architecturally from the user kind of experience aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And then as I started focusing on direct to consumer, really understood that there's a lot of opportunity in creating a brand that builds a personal relationship, effectively a personal relationship with your customer. Um, and in that, you know, had to make decisions around, well, how do we focus, particularly since I worked a lot with startups that were early stage, how do we focus on really building the core product and you know, make decisions around technology that are cost effective, resource effective, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so that really led to leveraging as much uh, as we can through integrations and that kind of thing that are you know, early on largely marketing focused, but mm -hmm. you know, 
as I already mentioned, when we first started trying to use off-the-shelf software for subscriptions, it was extremely painful if the, or when the company was growing fast and, and sure. it happened to work with some very fast growing companies, uh, which led to at the time having to build something custom. And to this day, I feel confident that the custom route was the right decision mm -hmm. because I'm still evaluating various subscription platforms that are out there and looking at, you know, what are marketers saying, what are even technologists saying about the current solutions that are available. And there's still a lot of frustration. And then from what I've seen, a lot of direct-to-consumer brands eventually still end up building something custom at this time. Gotcha. Well, I'd love, love to dig into that a little bit more. You're, you're starting to get at the heart of what we do and why we, we go about it. So uh, I'd love to go a little further there. Talk about what are some of the problems that when you go out into the marketplace and you're trying to solve purely from a technology perspective that are some of the more difficult, whether that's from a, you know, from a use case perspective, is it an infrastructure perspective? Is it, is it really about being able to evolve and control your own destiny over time? But what are, what are some of those things that are key to you when you're thinking about, do I pull this thing off of the shelf and use someone else's solution or do I do it custom? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Pause for a second here. <laughs> um, can you repeat the question? I'm trying to figure out the right, best starting point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're thinking about the technology and, and whether that's go and pull something off of a shelf, use somebody, use a third party solution, um, use open source software or just, you know, build something custom from the ground up. What are some of the key considerations there that, that you think about and say and, and kind of evaluate which of those is the right path? Right. Because some are going to be lower cost, faster speed to market and others are going to be, you know, you do something greenfield. It's you're talking about from the ground up that can be very expensive, very time consuming, but sometimes Sometimes that's the right decision. So how do you weigh those things out? <clears throat> yeah, I think there's two sides that I look at, which are the marketing perspective and then the call it retention perspective of what the customer's experience is using your product and your platform. Mm -hmm. So on the marketing side, you know, there's a lot of different ways marketers are trying to be creative in the types of um, discounts they offer or ways they package the product. And you know, early on, particularly if you're going to use a platform that's not custom built, you're constrained to what the possibilities are there. Yeah. And you know, you, you really try to milk that as long as you can. Maybe that sounds obvious, but um, it, it gets to a point sometimes as you learn more about your customer, you gather behavioral data, so on and so forth, that you really realize you need to change how you're communicating with them, the type of product offerings you give them, and ultimately it's the flexibility that the customer wants to right. stay engaged with your product. And that's, you know, there's a spectrum of points within there at which you need to decide, do we go custom? Do we switch platforms? That kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the, you know, customer perspective where you, they obviously you're starting to build this relationship, as I said before, direct to consumer specifically. And the customer, you know, over time really wants more flexibility in how often they get the product, what they, you know, when, when they go on vacations, you know, yeah. they want to pause it and all those natural right. things that happen. Right. And the cadences there are, are sometimes challenging to provide the very specific functionality they want. And then it also ties into fulfillment, right? Depending on your business and how the fulfillment works, how inventory works, you have some challenges to consider there too in terms of availability for shipping and what cadence is actually possible. And that's one of the right. things that's very specific to Pet Plate. Um, with frozen food, you know, which can spoil, uh, it's not shelf stable in, in, in terms of the frozen food product, uh, that you need to have very specific way of uh, coordinating all that. Yeah. So that, that's a lot of ins and outs, right? From if, if you look at all of, in your case, right, you, you, to your point, you have a physical product. It is perishable. Um, it has limited supply. And I'm sure you're trying to, you know, make it as you need it, not put a whole bunch of it into a freezer. So all of the, and then the to your point, the consumers, right? What are their expectations? Are they going on vacation? Do they want to upgrade their plan? I think you do a topper plan and a full plan, right? So that changes the quantities and things like that. Um, yeah. not, not to mention just right going out and acquiring new customers. When are they going to come in? How many are going to come? And uh, when do you have to fulfill all those products? So that's a lot of integration points, right? Whether that's to a third party system or in, that's even into a, you know, a module that you're building onto your own system. Um, that's a lot of data flowing back and forth. So 
Um, I think in, in a lot of these conversations, we say, well, what's core to your business that makes it unique versus what's the type of thing that's a, just purely a commodity, right? Almost table stakes um, in subscription. So are there any of those functions that you think are more straightforward and therefore a commodity that lend themselves? So whether that's, um, you know, what, that could be billing and payments, that could be fulfillment, um, that could be your marketing engine, your enrollment engine, uh, maybe the web platform itself. Um, are there any in your mind that lend themselves more towards the, yeah, if, if you're, especially if you're starting up, that's a good thing to go, you know, pull off the shelf Whether you know, maybe that's your, your website, you're going to go to Shopify or something like that and pull it down versus no, take the time to think this part of it through, because while you might be able to go get a solution now, you want to have the flexibility and scalability for the future. Does anything stand out there to you? I think the marketing side is pretty obvious top of mind that can yeah. be the thing that you outsource um, anything that is very data oriented right where you're trying to observe behaviors add algorithms around in our case you know we've got two two sets of algorithms one is how do we make sure we you know surface the right product to you but yeah. then the other one is how do we observe your behaviors and, and adjust whether it's the product whether it's our communication schemes that kind of thing so marketing very easily is is something i would outsource early um that said you know you need a data warehouse at some point too mm -hmm. to aggregate all of that which right. for some startups it takes some time before that's really something you can uh you know budget for um but the, that's kind of the direction where a lot of these integrations go is that you're gathering data uh you're using data and and really anything data oriented can stay in my opinion kind of outside of the core product okay. um but then have an integration to feed in what you need to to influence your core product on the fulfillment side for us, it's very proprietary and very specific to how our business works. So that's something that, you know, is much harder to outsource. You know, that said, there are some some tools and software that, of course, can help with logistics and so on. Sure. But it's, it's not something that can very easily be done off the shelf because our operations team is very sophisticated in how they coordinate things. And particularly as you scale, you know, you've got things around margins and operating costs to consider, like, you know, to a very granular level. Yeah. And that's also where data uh, helps us figure out where we can bring in some optimizations and improve logistics uh, to improve the business. So when talking about fulfillment there, I, I know there's a number of companies out there. Bulu is one that comes to mind that's really good at not not your type of product, but more things that can be pulled off of a shelf and fulfilled, right? And putting into a box, you know, the box of the month clubs for the, for those types of products. Um, you've had experience with, you mentioned Freshly and Daily Harvest and, and now at Pet Plate, which is, you know, again, any kind of fresh food, fro frozen food that's going to uh, bring on its own set of complications there. Do you draw on that experience from the past? And is that the type of thing now that, hey, th there's, there's quite a few companies out there now that are getting into this spa space, not just for pets, but for humans too you know, the, those types of companies, you know, Blue Apron, all those, all those others. Are there suppliers out there now that are specializing in that type of subscription merchant? Or is that still the type of thing where it's going to be pretty proprietary to your business and therefore better, better suited to build it from the ground up? But you made a good distinction, right? Shelf stable versus, uh, you know, in our case, frozen uh, right. perishable goods, right? Uh, the, the more shelf stable it is, I think the more options you have, quite okay. frankly, right? I mean, again, right. that sounds maybe obvious, but right. uh, you know, the very simple things are um, Amazon fulfillment and those kinds of solutions as well, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to frozen, I think it's just much more complicated to uh, you know, deal with that kind of thing. Yeah. Do you, is that something that is changing over time for you guys as well? Or you kind of built out that system that works pretty well and, and it's stable. Um, I would think that as you scale and maybe go from a small kitchen to a bigger kitchen, maybe multiple kitchens that are making this sort of food, that's going to add to the level of complexity there. So the area that we've really focused a lot more on on the logistics side and, and fulfillment side is not so much, you know, the kitchen aspects per se, but really how to get the food to our customers faster. Right? Okay. So we, we rolled out a strategy last year uh, that completely revamped how we approach that and mm -hmm. made the delivery time one to two days to virtually every continental zip code. Um, where before it was two to three days, for instance. Okay. Plus you've got, you know, getting more into logistical challenges. You've got weather <laughs> and all these other things that happen, particularly with COVID too, where you had 
warehouses and transit systems shutting down and so on and so forth. And using the strategy that we implemented last year, we actually were able to circumvent some of the repercussions other companies felt more of. Um, so there, I think the logistics around this specific product has really been the area we're focused on. Um, but that said, you know, we, we want to roll out more products with in, in different ways, and that's going to open up more opportunities for us to potentially leverage some of those existing services that are starting to come about for yeah. shelf stable and that, those kind of products. Right. Right. So is that I, I trust that it is a, a component of your overall application that you guys built yourselves to kind of service that end of thing, the fulfillment and those logistics. Exactly. Yeah. Connecting the e-commerce piece to uh, the fulfillment side is all custom. Okay. You know, that's where you get into the schedules that are very specific to our business and how we operate. Um, you know, once you get into the warehouses and that aspect of things, there's again, other services that we leverage and, and we, we want to leverage, right? We, Again, mm -hmm. going back to where we want to focus our resources, we want to really focus on the core product. And we still look at the schedule as a core piece of that because we want to, you know, keep improving the flexibility we provide our customers in terms of optionality and, and all the things they need to, you know, stay a customer. Yeah. Well, OK, so that that brings me to something that's, a, I think, a challenge for everyone in this space. But it's got to be uh, especially challenging for you guys is you want to balance that. Uh, the operational efficiencies of, you know, a, a kitchen and a warehouse and fulfillment and and all of that with giving customers flexibility that they really expect online today, right? Being able to pause their subscription, uh, being able to go, oh, crap, I, I forgot something. Uh, like, I, I need this as quickly as possible to changing my plan to, hey, I just bought a new dog I want to add on or, or what, you know, all of those different things that are uh, just customers expect now, right? They don't expect to go yeah. to websites, see one product offered one way, build one way, delivered one way. They want flexibility, um, which can create headaches, right? So um, how do you balance trying to give customers as much flexibility as possible with those operational efficiencies? I mean, that's challenging, right? Uh -huh. it's, it's a very challenging problem. Um, part of that new system we rolled out provides you know, flexibility in terms of, for instance, the numbers of days that we ship the product out, right? Mm -hmm. We went from a system that was virtually one to two days a week to now around four, even five days. Okay. Uh, and, and that's where our customer service or customer experience team is really uh, you know, a huge, huge uh, component of our business, which is that they provide, you know, obviously the support to manage those orders, shift them around manually, uh, where needed and really are very hands-on and keeping the customer happy. Um, mm -hmm. But beyond that ma manual process, you know, it's it's really trying to geographically uh, make our product available a a as as far-reaching as possible. So that itself really lends itself to more flexibility. And you know, flexibility in some cases is also immediacy, right? They don't want to have to wait for too long because if you're waiting a week for uh, the next possible shipment date. Like you have to now coordinate your life around right. when this next order comes in, and we're yeah. trying to avoid that. Yeah, yeah. You don't want your customer to have to go to the grocery store and and buy food in the meantime. You want to get that to them as quickly as possible and keep that continuity with the customer, right? You don't want them exactly. <laughs> engaging in other <laughs> products if you can uh, if you can prevent it. I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, on that, the customer side of things and, and again, kind of around this this flexibility and giving customers really what they want, what has been the evolution there, particularly on the website, which I think is your primary marketing channel and the primary way you, you engage with the customers. But uh, talk a little bit about that evolution since you've been at PetPlate for a while on on how you offer features and, and functionality really to the customer and how are you co continuing to evaluate what features are important? Yeah, um, new things that they want to be able to do, you know, know, maybe add-ons, uh, treats and things like that, or, or whatever it is that you're considering, like, do you A-B test? Uh, do you roll it out to a certain subset of customers to kind of control it and get feedback for a little while? How do you guys decide what to what to put out there? Yeah, well, particularly in terms of the evolution, right? When Peplate first launched, it was very prescriptive, right? The idea was we have this these great recipes that are extremely healthy for your pets. It's going to you know help in certain cases, you know, overcome some ailments and so on. Um, but, you know, 
it started off, we expect you, you to, to serve two meals a day for, you know, X number of days, and then you need another box and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the calendar scheduling, choosing what the next ship date is, was, you know, one of the earlier improvements we made so that they had more control over that where okay. that might not have existed before. Sure. Then we opened up more days. So that's, that's kind of the, the scheduling flexibility. Then we introduced the topper plan versus full plan, right? There's okay. the idea that, you know, and talk about data and learning about a customer, um, observing that they don't all want to serve a full meal of pet plate, right? They yeah. still want to have kibble, you know, whether it's the economics of it or what have you, uh, to still start feeding something healthier along with what the dog might be comfortable with already. Um, and then also, you know, really realizing and, and deciding that the customer will buy whatever they want and use it however they want. Uh, so that kind of led to being less prescriptive and giving more control over um, the size of the plan you want, even if it's not the you know serving size that we recommend for your dog. If you want yeah. more food, less food, uh, that kind of a thing was, I would say, a critical change in our thinking, at least at one point. Um, and, you know, price point is, is a big one, right? Looking at the price point of our our product is that mm -hmm. you, you get a box and it's supposed to last you for a week, up to four weeks, depending on the size of the dog. And that can appear, you know, more costly than kibble and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we're focusing on ways to provide uh, new products at lower cost uh, price points, as well as flexibility of not having to commit. You know, those are things that we're evaluating mm -hmm. and looking at. How can we uh, make a, the, the subscription not a deterrent in terms of buying healthy human grade dog food. Yeah. Well, that that's, that's a struggle industry wide right now is everybody wants to dabble in subscription, right? They love FCFOs love the concept of recurring revenue. And there's just certain businesses that just don't lend themselves to it as well, or at least have a tougher road ahead of them because the consumers just don't think about, you know, certain types of products that way. You know, when Volvo and Ford and others got into cars and, you know, the idea of a subscription service, which wasn't totally different from leasing, which has been around forever, you know, that, that, was, that was hard for consumers to understand that I could just go to an app, press a few buttons, pay a very high fee, but you know, I've got a car and insurance and maintenance and all of that included. Um, so they had to, to think about it a different way. Have you had, have you guys had any struggles with that or was it this product offered in this way has just always been subscription first? I think, you know, I think it's always been subscription first purely around the idea that we want to help you improve the health of your pet. Yeah. Um, you know, that said, kind of diverging a little bit from pet plate specifically, but talking about products that do have some sort of natural replenishment, mm -hmm. but are not typically, you know, a subscription, I think of those as the potential for a just in time subscription, okay. right? That's the timing of communicating to your customer, uh, you know, when you know they're probably out of the product and they probably would buy again. So they're not committing to subscription, but you're effectively creating a subscription through communication, right? Mm -hmm. and I think that's the opportunity that a lot of businesses have is to focus on replenishment schedules that maybe aren't obvious to the customer, but they're obvious to your marketing team. And coming up with more tools and strategies around that, I think is gonna be a way to uh, potentially create a better user experience for some customers, right? Um, where they are still buying from you and don't feel like they're committed yeah, that, 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 that's a good one. That that communication combined with, with flexibility there. I'll, I'll tell you, before I tried Pet Plate, I was on an Amazon subscription for dog food. And one of the things that just frustrated me about it was, yeah, I had it on subscription, but I didn't want bags of dog food sitting there. So being able to adjust that subscription was surprisingly painful. Like sometimes all I wanted to do was push it out another week and then, you know, update all of the dates from there on out. But all I could do for some reason was cancel it all together. And I'm like, this isn't, this is trying to meet the customer where they need. And I cannot be the only one in this situation, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, you know, all about balance and, and trying to meet that specific customer need and not make things too painful for them. But I think you brought up a good point there, which is, you know, you can be subscription like through communication and just saying, hey, may, you might have run out uh, of this particular product. Would you be, you know, click here if you want to, uh, you know, make another order or something like that and make it, you know, pseudo subscription in that way. And then ironically, you look thoughtful. <laughs> right, right. You know? 
Yeah, you're, you're, you, you as, as, a, um, a, as a, brand. You know, a provider, a brand, are looking out for yeah. me, and, and I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So on the, particularly on the website today, are you guys seeing any challenges or having any uh, thoughts or seeing opportunities around customers and how they want to pay today? Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of conversations happening around, you know, credit card has been dominant in the U.S. For, for obvious reasons, and it's not really going anywhere. You've got a lot of things that are what I just call layers on top of credit cards, so digital wallets and things like that, which can be good for conversion because they can reduce friction. Um, but you've got, you know, buy now, pay later uh, solutions that are really coming back to market. They've really been around for a while, but are certainly make a uh, um, resurgence. And then, of course, all of the cryptocurrencies that people are t starting to dabble in. Are you guys considering anything there or, you know, is it our customers are wanting to pay by credit card and, and that's where we're really focused? <clears throat> Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we actually only rolled out the uh, digital wallets pretty recently, okay. and you know we, we've seen an uptick based on that. Um, but you know, one of the popular ones I think is is uh, PayPal across sure. virtually every commerce platform, right? Like right. I think it's a fifty fifty split PayPal and whatever else you offer. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know specifically that's one that we would probably roll out next. But um, overall, like it's it's more of the traditional things that we've been focused on. You know, mm -hmm. I think it'd be interesting to pay with cryptocurrency, but, <laughs> uh, maybe not our demographic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, we, we, we looked at the different categories of payment types, like even, you know, installments, but obviously installments don't work with the subscription because it's basically an installment already. Right. Um, but yeah, I think PayPal is really the, the obvious one. Uh, other than that, you know, it's, it's, yeah, nothing, nothing unusual, I would say. Have you guys seen any challenges, particularly around the, the pandemic? You know, a lot of people have lost their jobs and, and you know, whether yeah, I'm assuming you have probably have the typical mix of credit versus debit card in the portfolio, but um, any collection rate challenges or things like that? And then how do you guys address that? Yeah, um, so our business in general grew unexpectedly more than, uh, you know, through the pandemic, which mm -hmm. I think affected a lot of e-commerce, you know, Right. Huge boom, just the shift in behavior at the very least. Um, I think, you know, we haven't really had a, a change in those trends in terms of collection rates or any other kind of issues. Uh, our system for dealing with failed payments uh, seems to be working pretty well, particularly since it's a mix of kind of manual follow up with customers. Our mm -hmm. CX team is very hands on, not because not really because we don't have the technology solution, but because that's the most effective way to reach out and, and kind of recoup some of those uh, failed payments. Uh, so I think that's worked the best for us. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the strategy we, we recommend. I mean, you should do everything that you can from a, from a systems and best practices perspective to do whatever your efforts are to try to collect and, and keep that, not, not only collect the revenue, but keep the customer too, right? You know, you can't collect, exactly. you're eventually going to cancel. Uh, but combining that with outreach programs directly to the customer, uh, you know, whether it's a phone call or an email or some combination, um, is it, certainly certainly the best way to keep, hold on to those hard-earned customers for sure. Um, g going back to, we were talking, you know, about you know, the, the decisions of build versus buy and, and, you know, you're talking about what's core to your product and uh, versus the, the, the types of things that you can kind of more plug in and grow with over, over time. Are there any particular lessons that come to mind where you look back at whether it was pet plate or, or some other organization you were with of, uh, of a decision that was made or, or a path that the company went down. And then you were like, man, if I had just known this, you know, a couple of years ago, somewhere back uh, that I would have done different differently. Does anything come to mind there? Um, you're going to give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's okay. If you, if you don't have one, we can cut that out, but no, I, um, it, it's funny because I'll kind of just riff for a second. Cause, um, I've seen this progression and early, like we said before, early on the way I saw it, it was a scalability issue because mm -hmm. you had a self host. And then, you know, I tried out various SaaS platforms that were not really mature and they were just so limited in what they could provide. Yeah. Um, I do have an experience with a SaaS platform I used that was just a nightmare. Um, but, <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any value in, in kind of 
well, yeah, I like that one. Well, I, uh, I could tell you, I, you know, on our consulting side had done a number of RFPs because either the incumbent SaaS platform, payment provider, whatever, whatever the case might be, wasn't performing to the promises that they made, you know, when they were originally signed up and sold to that particular vendor. So they were looking to make a change, but also saw plenty of situations, even through the deployment process. Like we went through the RFP, checked a whole bunch of boxes, made, said all of the right things in the sales process, then got handed over to a deployment team and started doing the actual integration work. And then come to find out that, okay, we document 30 use cases. We're going through all of them to make sure that, you know, how, how are we going to go about this or how do we use your system for all of these? And you'd get through 20 of them, then get down to the last 10 and, you, and they'd go, oh, well, we don't do that. You're going to have to do that. We don't do this. You're going to have to work around and do it this way. And, and you started going, wait a minute, I, I'm, I went for this solution because it was supposed to make my life better. And now I'm doing a whole bunch of development work to so that my business will fit into your walled garden. Um, and that and actually even seen situations where the, the vet or the merchant completely backed out was like this now doesn't make sense anymore after being months into an integration project. Um, you know, so a lot of time and wasted effort and, you know, frustrated people on both sides of the equation at that point. But, um, you know, I, I, I asked the question because, you know, sometimes, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. but you look back on those situations, you were like, well, if maybe somebody would have asked this question or that question in a more detailed way, some of these things would have been uncovered sooner. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I, mean, I think for me, like, the thing that just sticks in my head and it's like resentment to WooCommerce, which is the platform <laughs> we use for Freshly and, and Daily Harvest, uh -huh. it, like that key decision to just build custom, um, I don't regret it, right? And to me, that's the lesson learned, like, but it was a, a symptom of the times, right? Where there sure. wasn't anything more mature. Um, aside from that, you know, SaaS in general, I, I stay away from because you have limitations, you know, from a consulting perspective, um, you know, you're trying to piece together what what is this direct to consumer brand trying to sell? How are they trying to personalize it? How does that feed into actual features that actually need to exist and uh, on the SaaS platform? Mm -hmm. And then how much of that needs to be built custom? And yeah, you naturally run into situations where uh, you don't even realize the, a limitation until you've you know built the implementation right. and then there's just something that's not there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those small things come up here and there. And, and it's for me, it's like, I stay away from SaaS solutions. Yeah. And, and I hope that's not a boring answer. No, um, you know, no. It, 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 it's, <laughs> no, it's not. And, and it's good perspective. I mean, like, like I said before, I think it can make sense for some, uh, some organizations, particularly startups, yeah. when it's just about, all right, get our product to market and get customers in the door. That's, that's really what we're focused on. You know, fine, go to, go to Shopify, go to Magento or, or something like that, and then use plugins to go to Stripe or whoever you want to, to get things up and running. That, that makes all the sense in the world. But don't just set it and forget it. Right. You're going to find yourself two, three, four years down the road. Your business has grown. Now, all of a sudden, the, the billing system goes, wait a minute, I can't bill more than 5,000 customers a day because, you know, everything grinds to a halt. Or, um, you know, what we see a lot, particularly with credit card processing, is you signed up for uh, fixed rate interchange uh, pricing, right? The, the 2.9 plus 30 percent, which again, when or 30 cents when you're small. That's fine. Not really right. a big line item. When you start to grow into the millions of dollars, you start looking at that going, well, if we had Interchange Plus and had a direct to acquire uh, uh, processing relationship, instead of going through a pay fact, we could actually save ourselves tens, hundreds of thousands or more. Um, but we, again, said it and forget it. Nobody was paying attention to it. Nobody thought to go back and reevaluate it once we got to a certain point, a certain amount of revenue or a certain time frame down the road. Um, and so those are frequently the situations we get brought into. Another good one is, is chargebacks and, and fees and things like that, which, again, when you're small, not that big of a deal. You grow, all of a sudden you get over 100 chargebacks and your chargeback to sales ratio starts creeping up towards 1%. You get this fun little letter from Visa going, you got to fix this or we're going to start fining you. Um, and, you know, that's when we get, you know, those phone calls again. So it tends to be, you know, those those situations where, you know, you just outgrew wherever you're at, whether that's your SaaS provider, your acquirer or just any vendor. Uh, sometimes it's even internal systems, you know, that were that were built, again, not thinking 
entirely about scalability that all of a sudden one day it was, uh, yeah, our billing system took a crap and now here we mm -hmm. are, right? The, trying to avoid those types of situations. <clears throat> Totally. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with various companies where that's really the sticking point is that rate, right? How do we get out of that rate? I mean, pet plate too, you know, we're always evaluating, you know, right now we're using Stripe. So how do we switch from that to something else? We've evaluated a couple of platforms and, you know, then it's finding a balance of, okay, which one sounds good. And then who's actually had experience with this and is it really going to, you know, move the needle in terms of, okay, you've, got a lower rate, but the cost for maintaining and integrating it is <laughs> yeah. moot, makes it moot, you know, like we, moot, we, kinda, yeah. we ran into that, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was earlier this year where we were looking at switching and then we heard about the nightmares people had this platform yeah. um, and decided not to uh, pursue that right now. Um, so yeah, you know, in Shopify ecosystem too, like I, I, I keep an eye on Shopify, right? Because Shopify is extremely popular with all the integrations that you can have. Marketers can get up and run extremely fast. Right. Um, but there's a walled garden around that payment aspect for, for Shopify, and they're mm -hmm. you know clamping down even more. Uh, so it's interesting to see how uh, subscriptions are evolving on that platform right now. Right. They're trying to make that core to their service offering, but it's very early, and it's hard to say you know what the limitations are there. But I know there's a lot of merchants who have uh, not enjoyed the subscription options because uh, they outgrow those pretty quickly. Right. Pretty quickly, meaning like, you know, healthy businesses mm -hmm. um, gr outgrow pretty quickly. And there's not really much you can switch to. So, well, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, another thing that the, the trend due to PCI, you know, going back 10, 15 years is that merchants wanted to get out of touching pan information. You know, they didn't want to touch the account yes. information anymore. So they started using hosted forms and iframes provided by token service providers, or a lot of times your payment processor had an integrated solution, which sounded great, right? I could have that payment information go directly over there. I never had to touch it on my website. So that really limited my PCI scope. Sounds like a great plan, right? Well, guess what? You just put on handcuffs with that particular provider because now they hold all of the tokens. Um, and even early on, a lot of them didn't have any rights in their contracts to ever extract those tokens, you know, convert them back and move to a different provider. Contracts mm -hmm. now do, and we certainly advise it, you know, always put that in there that you have the right to request an extract and, you know, get your tokens back, have it sent to somebody else. But that's another cost to, to, uh, to changing, you know, to moving somewhere else is that, all right, I've got to go through this entire very painful exercise of extracting all of these tokens from here, putting them over there, pointing all of my payment pipes you know, to a different place, you're right. In so many situations, yeah, there could be cost savings from a, you know, dropping a couple cents per transaction over time, but you know, it's, it's a moot point. It would take me three years to recover all of that cost. And so for that reason, you know, people get locked into vendors, which makes the initial decision that much more important, right? Yeah, because you're gonna That's probably true. be there for a while. Um, and those are just, you know, some of the things that people don't think about. They're just like, I, I don't know, I just need payment processing, sign here, click here, I'm, I'm off and running, you know, and it, it can be a, it can be a painful one. We'll deal with it later. We'll deal and, with it later. You know, exactly. for some people that works, for some people it doesn't. It does. It does. And some <laughs> people stumble into the to the right service provider. Others make very conscious yeah. decisions and you know do formal RFPs or at least something like that to to think about what our needs are and who's going to best serve that. Um, and those things can can certainly you know pay off in the long run, but. You know, sometimes you just find yourselves with you ended up with the wrong vendor, or maybe they were maybe they were the right vendor for a, a period of time, and then somewhere along the way, they got bought. They changed hands. Your account manager changed from, you know, Sally to 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 Bill, and all of a sudden, you know, your it it dropped off. We've seen that happen so many times before too. So, it it, it can be a tough one, and it's not static either. <laughs> Well, there's also a component for the merchant, how technical they are or what their sure. appetite is for taking right. on that piece, right? Yeah. Obviously, that's why people go with SaaS products like Shopify, because they offload virtually all the technical work right. and the technical talent they need to hire. doesn't need to be too sophisticated to get a theme and so on built up. You've got the app integrations that really let you add features uh, pretty easily, but you still have that walled garden around the checkout. And, you know, I think... Right now, there's more and more creativity around that checkout page mm -hmm. itself being like, you know, uh, pre-purchase, post-purchase upsells, all sorts of 
points at which you're trying to surface something to increase the order value. Right. And, you know, Stripe is very attractive because they facilitate the transaction, drop it in, you design the entire experience, yep. but then you need to deal with the tokens yourself, right? Right. Um, with Shopify, they do it for you. They have very specific ways you can integrate, but it's very limited from what marketers want to, or merchants want to do. So right. it's, it's finding that balance too. And, and, and most of the time, that's what really causes the issue we started discussing before is making that decision around <laughs> yeah. payment yeah. gateway. But well, user experience seems to be the, the, the trend right now where they get frustrated. Absolutely. Well, and, and you know, just to add to that, so you're, uh, you guys operate just in the contiguous U.S. today, right? Or in That's Canada. correct. That's okay. correct. So whether you or others decide to go into Canada, Latin America, certainly into Europe and Asia Pacific, you, it, those areas are not just the U.S. again, right? There's completely right. different regulations, completely different pay, payment methods, different consumer behavior. Heck, Latin America, the concept of recurring billing is so foreign to them um, that, you know, for anybody in subscription, it's it's a challenge. The, those payment methods that they have there just don't lend themselves towards recurring pull, uh, you know, pull type transactions. Um, they're just not facilitated for that. Europe's better for that and to a certain degree, Asia Pacific. But you know, you, you just you don't know these things until you start to go after it. And all of a sudden, again, the, whatever vendor or platform you're working with, even maybe your own homegrown system didn't account for currency codes, didn't account for, uh, you know, I, I can accept a, a 16 digit credit card in this field. But uh, when I go, you know, when I go to Latin America and try to use uh, some in-country payment method now that, oh, gosh, it's a string. How do I store that? You know, <laughs> those types of things start coming into play that, that you, you never thought of before. So, yeah, when, when you when it's yours, you have all the control in the world. Right. At that point, it's just time and money. Um, when you're with a vendor, it comes down to, all right, are they is this on their roadmap? Is this something they've already solved for? Is this something that and now it's pro services? I've got to pay them to do it. You know, you've seen all of these things come into play, but you have far less control at that point. So, you know, it's it's all the balancing act, right? <laughs> it, it really is. Yeah. And it, with Pet Plate, for instance, you know, there's obvious places that we'd want to expand to, like Canada is hopefully the, sure. the simplest one, right? right. Um, but, you know, as we think about expanding internationally, not, not saying we are, but, you know, with the prospect of that, it's not even just the payments, right? It's virtually mm -hmm. everything that's to be rethought, even just from right. a product and language and so on perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for a, for a company like Pet Play, as well as many others, when you get to that pivotal point, there's going to be an evaluation of, hey, do we want to replatform? Or mm -hmm. how much do we want to replatform? Right. And that can be an interesting, daunting, or exciting, you know, kind of uh, exploration. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be there soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Joel, I've certainly enjoyed the conversation. Been fun to get into the, the weeds of some of this stuff and hear from a technologist like myself who's kind of, you know, been through this for a while, been in the trenches and, and learned some of the lessons. I think it's been a lot of good information for, for our listeners. If any of them have more questions or just want to get in touch with you, where, where can they do that? Yeah, you can reach me at joel at petplate.com and shoot me an email. Happy awesome. to have a conversation. And then the awesome website is petplate.com. Highly recommend. Again, I'm, I'm becoming a customer myself and uh, great product, great experience on the website. So can't recommend that enough too. And shoot me an email if you want to get a special deal. See what I can do. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joel, thanks again. I appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Great. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.